All right, welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to um, find the acceleration of an object rolling down an inclined plane. So this is going to involve a little bit more um, uh, math than just finding the um, acceleration of an object sliding down a plane. Because we're going to have a disk here, and that disk is going to be rolling. And to roll an object, um, we have to apply a torque. and it takes more energy. We have not only do we have the energy to, um, you know, of the sliding energy down, but we got it. takes energy to spin it too. So some of that energy now is going to be used to spin it and to to make it move down in a linear fashion. So the first thing we always do when we have any type of a problem like this is we're going to have to define our axes. So I'm going to take my axis and I'm going to define it first here. My y is like this. My x is down the inclined plane. So it's very similar to, again, to that block sliding down. Uh, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my forces acting on this object because we have a center of mass here, right? And, um, you know, we, we typically assume that the forces are all acting at the center of mass, even if in the in beginning levels when we're talking about friction. Sometimes teachers will draw it at the center of mass, but we know friction is not at the center of mass, right? It's not there. So now we're going to have forces that are going to be you know not just at the center of mass but also at the surface and those are going to cause the object to rotate it's going to cause it to to spin so the first force i want to talk about here is gravity and we know the force of gravity just points straight down right the force of gravity just points straight down and um we also going to have uh the normal right so what is the normal force well it's a reaction to whatever's pushing on the surface, right? It's a reaction to whatever's pushing on the surface. It's not a reaction to gravity. It's just a reaction to whatever's pushing on the surface. So the normal actually is, is here. It's actually at the surface. But since that line of action passes through the center of mass, I can just slide that up. That's not a problem. Okay, so for example, what you may be saying, well, what is line of action? Let me make that solid. Line of action is just if I took an object here, let me just change this real quick so you can see that. If I took an object here and um, drew a line straight through the center of mass like that, you can see the line of action is like that. So we can we can typically slide vectors um, along the line of action. I'm trying to grab that vector there we can slide vectors along the line of action. It's not going to affect the ability of this thing to rotate at all. So if I take my vector, if I take my vector here, you can see that I could slide that up and down that line of axis. It's not it's not going to change it on either side of the center of mass. So the line of action allows me to slide that vector up and it's not going to really change anything. So I'm going to go ahead and write the normal there at the center of mass, but just to emphasize it's re it's really not there, right? We know that it's not there. But that was just just an example. Okay, I'll make it a little bit shorter there. Okay, now we also have a force here that's causing this to rotate, and that force is going to be friction. Now, a lot of times we draw friction in the center of mass just to simplify the situation, but in reality, where's friction? We know friction is at the surface here, okay? And since this object is not rolling under power, right? If it was under power of an engine, that friction would be the other way. The friction is going to oppose that direction. So I've got here, I've got my... Uh, my force normal here at the top. I've got my force of gravity here. And I've got my force of friction here. Okay. And we know that I have to resolve these into their respective components. And we know that the uh, component of gravity in this direction is actually going to be more than the friction because it's going to give us a net acceleration. So I'm going to go ahead and draw just these components just to simplify here. So this is, if, if the force of gravity is just mg, okay, this is going to be mg cosine theta, and I define this in another video, okay, and then this component here is actually going to be uh, mg sine theta. So before we even do anything, we have to really define what that's all about, and then I get rid of this um, component here. I just strike it out just to show that it's no longer there. But these are my forces now acting on this object. I also have um, I have some mass m okay, for this object. Mass m. Um, and this object, I said rolling object. okay. So this is the mass m here. 
and I also have a rotational inertia uh, here at the center of mass. Let's just call that I center of mass. And that's going to it's going to matter because depending upon where we take the torque, we we may have to apply the parallel axis theorem. But this has a mass m here and an I center of mass. Now, notice I said the word object here. I didn't say disk. I didn't say hoop. I didn't say sphere because this could be any of those. So I'm going to define a a situation here where you you can determine that for for any of these uh, situations, okay? So basically, at this point, what we're doing is we're setting up a system of equations, and you know we need to define um, the x and the y, and we're going to have to define a torque. And the question arises when we get to the torque: where do we take the torque? Do we take it here? Or do we take it here? Or do we take it here? And the answer is it doesn't matter where you take it. You'll get the same answer. Symbolically, it may be different, but you'll get the same answer. It really doesn't matter. And so typically when we take the torque, we're going to take it from the spot that's going to give us, I think, the simplest equation. And that's going to be at the surface here. So uh, the first equation I'm going to take a look at here is I'm going to take a look at the, uh, the sum of the forces in the x. So when I take a look at my x equation, I'm going to say the sum of the forces in the x equals ma net in the x direction of the center of mass. Then I'm going to have a sum of the forces in the y here. Now in the case of the y, I know that my the sum of my forces in the y, I know that they equal zero. It's an equilibrium in, in the y. In the x, is, there's a net force, but in the y, it's an equilibrium. So in this case, we can simply say whatever's going up equals whatever's going down. It's an equilibrium. So I can I can basically tell you that the normal is going to equal mg cosine theta. Okay. And I can also tell you that um, in the x direction, I can say, you know, mg uh, sine theta minus the force of friction equals m a net. Let's just let's just leave that m a net. Just uh, I'm going to leave it as at, instead of writing x center of mass the whole time, just to simplify. Now, depending on what you, what you want to do, um, you know, I, I always encourage people to write out all the equations. We may not even use all the equations, okay? But if I wanted to break this down further, um, you know, I in terms of cosine or sine, depending on what I want to do with this, it, it matters to see both equations, okay? So those are your, your governing equations. Now here's the here's the one that I want to talk about, and that is uh, the torque equation. This is the third equation here we want to talk about. So we basically want to say the sum of the torques equals torque net. And this is basically Newton's second law applied to a rotating body. And in this case, we, we have, a, t we have a, a net torque because you have to ask yourself, how do we know if we have a net force? Well, the object's either changing direction, it's going faster and faster, or going slower and slower, okay, in the x direction. Is it going faster and faster in the x direction, like it, translationally? Yes, it is. Is it going to start rolling faster and faster and faster? Yes, it is. So there's a net, there's a net torque here. So the net torque is going to equal I alpha here, okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the torque, I'm going to actually take it from this point right here. I'll take that torque right there. That's where I'm going to take my spin of my object. And um, you know we're going to do that uh, to, for simplicity's sake to, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to eliminate the force of friction here basically. Okay, so it's going to, by doing that, it, it, it eliminates that variable. If I take the torque from a radius of zero, that's zero, so I'm going to just eliminate a force. It's going to make it a little bit simpler. But what that's going to do is that's going to change my um, my uh, moment of inertia. I'm going to have to apply the parallel axis theorem. So let's take a look at the these torques here before we get ahead of ourselves here. I know this picture is going up and down here, but let's take a look here. Um, Okay, so typically anything, if I'm taking the torque here, this is causing a clockwise rotation, right? Anything that causes a clockwise rotation, we say that's a negative torque. Um, it, you know, when we're, when we're talking about um, spinning directions. But in this case, um, the object's going to be spinning in that direction. So we, could, we can just leave it positive if we want. It doesn't really matter. So I'm going to take um, the force, okay? times the radius. So in this case, the force times the radius 
Okay, the force perpendicular, let's just call that, is going to equal I alpha. And in this case, the perpendicular force is going to be mg sine theta, okay? So I'm going to say mg sine theta, okay, times the radius, which is the moment arm, equals I alpha, okay? And we also know that um, we have to convert this now, this I, because when we're talking about centers of mass, we typically talk about, in this case, uh, you know, whatever it is, let's say it's a disk or a sphere, it doesn't matter. We talk about it rotating usually about through the center of mass. So the parallel axis theorem is basically going to, to tell us that, um, let me just kind of write it over here, okay, just as a little side note here. The parallel axis theorem, parallel axis theorem basically tells us that I equals I of the center of mass plus mh squared, where h is the distance, shortest distance to the point. Okay. In this case, it's going to be um, mr squared. So I is going to equal I center of mass plus m r squared. Okay. Now, I notice I left this as I center of mass for a reason. I didn't plug in what it is. I didn't tell you if it was a disk. I didn't tell you if it was a sphere. I didn't tell you if it was a hoop. I did, just, just told you that. Because this equation is going to allow you to, you can just plug in the I center of mass when we find the final equation for any of these situations. So it's, it's, very, it's very convenient, actually. And again, I, this, this PAT, I call this is just the parallel axis theorem. It's just a way to adjust uh, the the rotational inertia um, if you're not taking it from the center you take it, we're taking it from here we're just making an adjustment that's the adjustment that it makes okay so let's just continue here so I've got mg sine theta r and then let's let's move this over a little bit here, is going to equal I center of mass plus MR squared times alpha. Now remember alpha is a little side note over here too. I'll put that one in purple over here. You can see that. Alpha is going to be rotational acceleration, okay? And that's going to be the linear acceleration divided by the radius. Okay, and basically this rotational acceleration is constant, but the linear acceleration is not. It depends where you are on the disk. Okay, so um, you know if if you're further away uh, on the outside of the disk, this this is value is going to be higher. Okay, but what we have to do is we need we want to get rid of that variable. Okay, so this is the rotational acceleration also known as the angular acceleration, however you want to call it, it's fine, it's the same thing. So I'm going to write that in now, is I'm going to write A over R here, okay? Okay, so now it, things are starting to, we, we've gotten rid of our rotational variables, we've adjusted for the fact that we're taking it at the surface, now we're just going to go ahead and we're going to solve for, we're going to go ahead and solve for the, um, the acceleration of the center of mass. So now I've, ri I've written this in blue, and I'm just I solved for the acceleration here, which is going to be the acceleration of the center of mass, okay, in the x direction, and I multiply the r over, so it's going to be mgr squared sine theta over i center of mass plus mr squared. Now a lot of times, what uh, if you want to get rid of the mass, you can actually, or sorry, you want, if you want to sorry if you want to get on the top, if you want to get rid of the mass, you can. You can divide all of the terms by mr squared. So a lot of times in books you'll see it written uh, simply like this. It, it will take all of the terms mg r squared sine theta and divide them all by mr squared. And a lot of times we do this when we're trying to find uh, asymptotes, we'll divide by the, you know, sometimes you know we'll divide by a term and take the limit as x approaches infinity. But this is just uh, to simplify this equation um, a little bit. 
And those of you who are in the AP Physics C uh, with calculus, or if you're in college calculus, uh, you should be good at changing uh, equations around like this and manipulating the variables. Uh, so when you do this, what you're going to see is that, I'll go ahead and cross these out in red here, you'll go ahead and see that that MR squared will cancel with this MR squared here, and this will just cancel out to become 1. So when you rewrite your equation, uh, you're simply going to get uh, a simpler form on the top, which is going to be g sine theta over 1 plus i center of mass over mr squared. Okay, And that is going to be uh, the shortest form of your uh, acceleration of the center of mass. Now I want to point, again, I want to point something out here. There's a lot of things here I want to point out here at the end. Uh, one of them is this, okay? Um, when we are talking about this I center of mass, okay, this could be for a, this could be for a sphere. This could be for a disc. This could be for a hoop. It really doesn't matter as long as it can roll and you have a definition for it. This could be for, you know, a, a hoop, like a, like, like a disc with a mass on the outside, okay? So this could be, this could be you know, it's, it's just any, any combination, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. So that's why I left it as I center of mass. We could have plugged it in for a disc, but this is a lot more convenient for what you're trying to do, okay? So let's, let's just go back for a second. So you might have said, well, why did we go through all the trouble? Why did we find, why did we find the x components and the y components here? Uh, if we just went ahead and used the torque straight up, right? Well, we kind of needed to do this, first of all, to find out that the perpendicular component, if we were talking about the, the force here, the perpendicular, okay, that's creating the torque from this point was mg sine theta, number one. Number two, if we wanted to take the torque from another spot, um, now all of these are in play, okay? mg sine theta, um, force or friction, all of these start to come into play here. If I wanted to, you know, maybe I needed to plug in, you know, we know that the friction is going to be um, uh, mu times the normal, okay? So if I wanted to go ahead and plug that in and solve it in terms of cosine theta, I could have also. So there's just many possibilities here. So when you're taking a torque of an object and you're finding, and you're dealing with rotational, um, you know, dynamics and kinematics and um, you know, rotational force, all of these different things, you, you should be really skilled in terms of where you should, where you want to take that torque, and you should be able to take it from anywhere. Now, the final answer symbolically may look a little different, okay, than what we have here, but I think that in general, this is one of the, the more simpler forms or simpler expressions of the acceleration of the center of mass, and so, uh, you know, we can take that torque uh, fr from the surface, okay, and this is also a good exercise, okay, first of all, to understand that it doesn't matter where we take the torque, number one. Number two, um, by taking it here, it kind of forced us to make an adjustment uh, to the uh, rotational inertia, the moment of rotational inertia here, simply because we were not taking it from the center of mass. And now we have to do the parallel axis theorem. So it, it makes you practice using this theorem, right? Uh, when you're solving these equations. So, and, but in reality, when you're getting into these equations, you're really just working with a system of three equations. And at this point, uh, it's going to be uh, working with the algebra just to manipulate the surround and move it around to how you want. All right, that's all I got for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.